very, very pleased um, to welcome uh, Kim Joyce Bernard from the Horace Mann School in New York City, who is the um, um, PhD, by the way, who's an, an incredibly innovative program leader and practitioner and scholar with many years of experience, two decades of experience, uh, providing educational technical guidance and out of school time programming to urban schools. And she writes and presents about parent, family and community engagement, service learning, which is so important to us, and um, ethics and family and intergenerational literacy programming all through, well, in part through the Horace Mann School. She's currently the director of the school the Center at Harz Mann School in New York City for the Center for Community Values and, and Action. Um, in, you're in the, the Bronx, as I understand it, I think. And she's known for administrating, um, administering uh, creative programming, cultivating work processes, and fo fostering a real collaborative, effective learning environment that promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is in some large part our focus today. Um, before she was at the Horace Mann School, and we'll, we'll get Kimberly to unpack some of her own personal history, um, she worked in various capacities at a, um, as a family and community engagement director, a program manager and literacy teacher trainer in urban schools in New York, Central America, and Massachusetts. And, and this is no small thing, she's a, a proud alumna of AmeriCorps and Peace Corps. And I have met some of the most amazing people that I know through AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps recruits some of the best of the best. So Kim, that was your introduction. Now, can you backfill some de details for us? And I'll, I'll prompt you along with the storyline, but you're at Horace Mann in New York City currently, which is an independent school, correct? It is. So hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kim Joyce Bernard. I'm so thrilled to have you just join myself and Joe today. Thank you for that warm welcome, Joe, and even, you know, that introduction as well. As you can see from that introduction, I have a myriad of hats that I've held uh, as an educator, and it's absolutely amazing. I feel very, very, very lucky to have been in so many different capacities. One thing I can say right away, Joe, is that the conception of Sankofa, which is a Ghanaian symbol that some of you may know, where there is a bird who holds an egg in its mouth and is looking backwards, and it means retrieve and go back. And I'm always someone who is very passionate about making sure that I think about the history that I am a part of and also where I stand and, and my actual positionality and who I am and how that informs me as an educator. And I can't help but talk about uh, my journey as an educator without first acknowledging that I am a, a woman who grew up in Brooklyn, New York in a place that I say was my own village in that space. I had both my uh, parents who immigrated from South America, and it was an absolutely amazing experience being a young child going through the public school experience in Brooklyn and having my family and having so many people who were connected to me to help um, me navigate those spaces. But some things that I learned as a child was the power of our history, the power of oral traditions, and it sits with me throughout all of the work that I'm currently doing. So I can start there, Joe, and I, and I can definitely fill in on other things as well. But I just want to start there. That's a great start, uh, Kim, and, and thanks. I, I would be interested, actually, in leaping right into the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. and, and where does that come from from you? That's very important to Community Works Institute, as, as you know. Where does that come from for you, and why is it? Important. Yeah. I just have to say that the, the power of 
thinking about intersectionality. So I have to bring Dr. Crenshaw's work into this, thinking about myself as a black woman who is navigating a sp different spaces and especially thinking both with the hat of having been a student and then also thinking about the hat of being an educator. So having the privilege and the honor of working with, with children right now, I, I realize that oftentimes for myself as a as first generation American, as someone who grew up with uh, immigrant parents, that the oral tradition and that portion of knowing that literacy was so powerful in my house because of the stories that were told to me about who I am. So I can tell you such candid stories about my, grandfa my grandfather who I never met or my grandmother who I never met and all of their savvy ways that they may do with a very large family in Guyana and how that taught me so much about connection and ensuring that you build your village and that there is this concept of we. And it, it naciated within me and left a question with me as I was navigating school and I saw how difficult it was for my own family and for my parents in particular to figure things out. And, for, and that actually ended up sitting with me up to the point that as I navigated through school and had amazing teachers who were able to be able to, to demystify what schooling was, that there is a specific way to walk in school, that there is uh, both the curriculum that is told explicitly. So there are those pieces where I knew about certain expectations that were written down and how I need to perform as an actual student intellectually. But there were pieces in terms of the culture that were completely foreign to me and did not necessarily mirror what was happening at home. And one of those had to do with oral tradition was that I did not see myself in the books that I saw in school as I as I came up through elementary school and middle school and high school, and that the stories that I was told and the literacy that interjected my own house uh, wasn't necessarily centered in, in the space of schooling. So I learned that there was a difference in terms of operating both in and out of those spaces. So I'm constantly thinking about who is showing up in the work that I'm doing. So now in this role of being a director and that is focused on this critical social justice lens on service learning, I'm constantly thinking not only who is showing up, how we're showing up, and then what's the story that's being told about everyone who is showing up? So what's the narrative? Is there a continued conversation that just reiterates this uh, narrative of oppression around BIPOC people, around Black, Indigenous, people of color, and for people who are culturally and linguistically diverse and for people who are often historically marginalized in schooling spaces. And I'm constantly thinking about interrogating that sort of language because of my own lived experience. And I realized that there's power in that. So I really try to make sure that I center that in the work that I'm doing even now. Where, where, where do you think, Kim, where, where do you think that first emerged for you as a young person? Yeah, I, you you know, I do. And you know, it's so beautiful because I can talk very much about my PhD program and having an opportunity to reflect upon my own positionality. So where I stand in the world and how I developed my specific uh, way of seeing the world. And when I think about it, I have the earliest memories of being a small child just at the feet of, of family members and hearing these stories and being around them and hearing the power and the beauty of, of who I am and what I've come from as a Black person, but not necessarily seeing that in the classroom. So finding myself as a small child, I remember being in like first grade, literally sitting down with friends at the lunchroom and like telling these stories I used to hear from my own family members, like it's so candidly, because I wanted to then talk about me. I wanted to somehow center myself. And it's so interesting because specifically in kindergarten, everyone tells me that I actually stopped speaking for some time, or I had a, a, a moment where I wasn't really talking in my classroom. I was just, I just was not. And I think I thought about that as I journeyed through my PhD program, like why was that happening for me specifically? And when I reflect on it, I do think that I go, I was going through what you know, Mesro calls a disorienting dilemma, you know, and I didn't have the language. 
I didn't have the words or I was going through what some call a cognitive dissonance. You have what was at home and what, you, what I knew for myself was centered in this story of power and beauty, wholeness at home, but then coming into a schooling environment that necessarily didn't necessarily uh, have that same sort of language about who I was. So there was, there was silence for some time and it really spurred me in my, in my PhD work to actually want to go back to early childhood. So one of the things that I did was I interviewed families who were African born families in a very specific part in, in New York, who I had the pleasure of working with uh, through some programming that I was doing around family and community engagement. And I centered their narratives about their interactions with early childhood programming. So how were they learning to both hold on to their culture, who their, their own identity, their, their connections within their communities, and then also at the same time, then have their children navigate a space that was completely new to them, that, that may not necessarily be multilingual, that uh, may not necessarily always have an equal exchange of thoughts uh, in a way that will allow for a really empowering experience. So it really spurred me to want to know more about myself. Through my journey for my PhD program, I feel really honored and so blessed that I had an opportunity to be able to go on that journey because I got to think about myself and my own navigation of these spaces. And I'm constantly thinking about that as an educator today. So my, my question would be, how many brothers and sisters do you have? I just have one brother and we are super tight, <laughs> extremely, extremely close. And we're literally two and a half um, years apart. Mm -hmm. But what I will say is that I grew up, um, Joe, in a family where I had many aunties and grew up with a lot of cousins who I would also consider brothers and sisters. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I'm getting at. I, I <laughs> Avoiding my own um, personal stuff. No, I, I grew up in a large Irish clan and there were a lot of stories being told. Mm -hmm. and, and it sounds like that was similar with you and they're the elders telling the stories and they're a certain smaller percentage of the young folks paying attention. And it seems to me, I don't want to make assumptions, you were paying attention. Definitely. And, and, I wh and why, why do you think that is? Why were you paying attention? We're not going to pin it on your brother, but why were you paying attention versus other younger folks? What do you think? You know, I think that we all have different ways in which we interact with our families, right? And I think that even if as an adult right now and as a mother myself, I still surround my children with these stories, even if I think they're paying attention or not, just because I realize that they need the affirmation, especially as Black children who are navigating predominantly white spaces and predominantly white institutions, uh, that there is power in them knowing who they are in themselves because then there's an opportunity here as adults to rewrite the narrative. Because oftentimes what's happening, and we see it today, is that the, the picture and, the, and what is told about people who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and people who have been historically marginalized in educational institutions and throughout our American system, oftentimes the story that is told is one that is completely constricted. It is one that does not allow for there to be a fluidity or even an expansion of what the narrative is. And there is an opportunity here to, uh, to allow for families to know that, you know what, even if you do believe that maybe it's not making an impact for your child, there is an, an impact that can be long lasting because you're affirming their identity in a way that may not necessarily be affirmed in other spaces that they're in. And I, the other piece to this, Joe, is the reason why I intentionally chose to center the narratives of the families themselves is because I wanted to interject the voice of African-born immigrants into the canon. The canon is often dominated, especially in educational landscape, is often dominated by the perspective of the teachers who we know in the United States of America are predominantly white women. So when we think about that, how can we ensure that those families who are 
uh, very much a part of the relationship and the, the growing of their own children are that their voices are also centered. And what I also will add to this is that our current state right now where we're thinking about before times and we are sitting here at a time during COVID and this, this pandemic and social unrest has shown the importance of being able to ensure that the family narrative, that the, that the narratives that are within communities are, are brought forward, that there's an acknowledgement and affirmation that there is power in that. Yeah, yeah, and, and for sure. And, and one of the things that, you know, since we began our shift into the COVID wave, last March, one of the things that's been very clear is that there's a, a normal, quote unquote, that many of us feel we do not want to go back to. And mm -hmm. the idea of the issues of equity that have been raised are just absolutely monumental. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not simply a question of having equipment or a Wi-Fi spot or whatever it is. It's all been on full naked display. Now, I'm going to shift gears here. You're you're teaching at a um, an independent school in New York City that serves a certain population of students. You're welcome to fill in the blanks here, um, and it's had its challenges. And anyone has been challenged by this COVID thing. That's that's for sure. But what are, what are your thoughts in specific or general, whether they be related to school experience or in general invitation to comment on what, what COVID, the pandemic, the lack of in-person student services, what have you, what, what are your what are your comments around that? that? That was a really broad question, but do you want to try to tackle that? Sure. So, you know, I'm really honored right now. I have the opportunity to be a director of a service learning program, and I see myself still very much as an educator, even though I'm not in the traditional classroom, but I get to be a part of those extended learning time opportunities. And as someone who is very focused on thinking so much about just the power of expanding the frame in, in terms of what students are able to see. Uh, it has been an absolutely powerful experience because I have the opportunity in my service program to actually frame it with a critical social justice lens. And I'll speak to what that means. What that means is that there is an absolute assumption and a premise that I'm operating on that acknowledges that there are already social inequities and that there are so many systems that, that create a compounding effect of social inequities for those who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color and those who have been historically marginalized within our communities and within with all throughout the United States. And what we what I realized through doing this work is that it's so important, especially because I have the opportunity to work very closely with high school students, is to move past the cursory to allow for students to really tackle three very simple questions, the what, the so what, and the now what. So really helping them to realize that, you know what, you're learning these things in school, you're learning about you know, various sort of disciplines, but here is how it's applied in the real world. And one of the things that I think so much about is that no matter what you're talking about it in terms of housing inequity or you're thinking about, you know, our the healthcare, <laughs> these things happening around or learning about, you know, various sort of disciplines, but here it's it, it you then are able to see that there's an opportunity here to then ask these deeper questions. And what really resonates for me, especially working within the high school setting predominantly is the ways in which young people are already ready to have these conversations. They have been leading so much 
of the consciousness that has occurred within our nation within the past year, they, they are ready. They are, are willing to step into some really messy spaces and allow for these disorienting dilemmas and allow for, for the opportunity to have this cognitive dissonance where they are holding up two things that oftentimes we'll hold up as characters. And we'll say there's either or, instead of really stopping to say, there's a yes and in so much of life and it shows up. So while we're talking about educational opportunities or we're, we're discussing these things, there is a, a there is power behind talking about each and every one of these issues that we're facing within specifically looking at the Bronx in a place where there is a huge dichotomy in terms of what's happening in the Southern Bronx and what's happening in the Northern Bronx where my school is located. So thinking about how each of these specific neighborhoods were intentionally designed and we can look at history and see how these compounding inequities and this divestment from urban areas, specific urban areas that have affected and continue to, to affect uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color and historically marginalized communities occurs today and is, is prevalent today. So helping students to really you know, delve into this what, this what, so what, and now what, and helping them to also enter those conversations where they're ready. Because what I'm also aware of is that along the spectrum of developmental education and thinking about where children are in this developmental process, how you enter the work of service and how you talk about any of these topics is very different when you're talking to a child who is four versus a child that is 16, right? Or even a six, the two 16 year olds are in two different places. But there's so much opportunity here to have real exchanges about lived experiences and a real learning curve, not only for the students, but also for the adults that are part of this work as well, the varying stakeholders both in and outside of the school. Yeah, it's, it's um, you, you unpacked a lot there. Um, we're talking about a, a, a K through 12 continuum mm -hmm. and what kids are ready to talk about and what they should be ready to talk about. And, you know, also you didn't specify this, but educators comfort level at talking about things mm -hmm. at various grade levels. Can I get you to double back on that in a generalized way? Not talking about your school, but in general, your experience? Right, so here's the, the power, I believe, even as the educators, I think about my own journey. It is so important that we as educators, and, and I'm saying as an educator generally, so all throughout the United States, that we are aware of where we're coming from, what our implicit biases are, and actually what our history is and how and what our specific lenses are. Because what I'm realizing, especially right now in an environment that is absolutely hostile to being able to even consider different perspectives, there's no way to be able to bridge and consider uh, where students are within the spaces that we get to uh, be in and in the institutions that we get to be in unless we have a real understanding of who we are. So I know for myself, I continue going on that journey and reflection is crucial, absolutely crucial as an educator. And so had, taking that time though, if something is not sitting well, being able to say, I don't, wait, let me hold on to this and let me double back and figure that out. And one of the things that I've done very intentionally this past school year was within my department is really allow for those areas of tension to, to uh, really come to the fourth by having specific opportunities to build a highly effective learning community. We created a tea time within my department where if every couple of months we are reading specific books. So in order to ensure that we were on the same page with our students, we started with Ibrahim Kendi's um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And we sat down weekly with this book and our tea or you know, with our water and sat down and talked deeply to not only have a connection with each other, but really challenge and figure out where we stand in, in these very various topics. And then also being able to reflect upon the things that we're hearing from our students, because so much comes up as they are interacting with the agencies 
that surrounds and are within the Bronx area, which we work closely with. And some of these agencies, you can imagine there are places in which are better funded than others, right? And there are so many differences in the experiences that the students are, are seeing and learning about. So it's been an opportunity to, for us to learn as the adults. And I think that it's okay to sit with that. And that's one of the things that I've learned as an educator is that it's not only calling on the students to do the reflection, because that's very much a part of the programming that I have. We have a very intentional time of having a reflection period weekly with our students after school, but also calling on the adults to do that work too. Really, really briefly, and I, I do mean really briefly, um, the Bronx mm -hmm. has an image with the American public, whatever that means. And can you deconstruct that very quickly? Because the Bronx is, it has an image. Mm -hmm. Can you de deconstruct that really quickly? And you know, it's so interesting because even as you say the Bronx, you know, I hear that. And to me, it brings so much pride and just excitement about the Bronx because I've had the pleasure of working there for a number of years now. And even where my home is located, I'm on the Bronx River. So it's beautiful to be connected in that way, but I also understand- I'm sorry, there's a there's a Bronx River? There is a Bronx River. <laughs> I, did not, I did not know that. <laughs> yes, and actually uh, I'm gonna go to be taking both my m and my children out to the Bronx River to do a cleanup uh, in the next okay. couple of weeks, hopefully. But uh, one of the things that I realized is that, you know, part of the narrative that's told about this very specific borough often centers on the deficit. And this is part of when I think about the programming and, and the, the critical social justice lens of the programming that I'm doing around, around this, um, around the work that I'm doing, it's very crucial to be able to unpack that and be able to say, I'm not looking at where I live in the deficit, instead I'm looking at it as an asset. So looking at all of the positives, there's so much beauty and grace and music and people who have come out of the Bronx. And there's such a story of resilience of the Bronx. And I would highly recommend that, you know, people do way more research on learning about, you know, the Bronx is burning and how that was a part of the story and the history, but that actually the community themselves helped to bring back their own community. You know, and that's often not the narrative that is told about the Bronx. And there are so many agencies that can say that are located in the Bronx. And I think of Kings Ridge Heights Community Center, Riverdale Neighborhood House, Riverdale Senior Services. Oh my gosh, there's a myriad of amazing programs in the Bronx that are actually looking at the community within the Bronx and saying, okay, we need to galvanize and meet each other's needs in a really powerful way. And then also have a voice in a, in a new way. And I'm grateful because my programming gets to completely intersect with that sort of work and help to center, help the students at my school uh, be able to learn about that work from the actual community partners themselves and hear from that sort of pers that perspective, which is asset based. Well, it's, it's so helpful. I think, you know, the Bronx has an image somehow or other through Hollywood movies and otherwise. It's helpful to hear that. And, and also you were, you were a participant at the um, at CWI Summer Institutes and we put a big focus on collaborative ethnography, place-based education, et cetera. And I'd be very interested in how that influenced you as you went forward with your work at Horace Mann in the Bronx. Yes, and what I will say right away is that as I'm working within service learning, I'm constantly thinking about the importance of making sure that it's not a system that's set up where everything is hierarchical and that I am ensuring that our programming is not one that just centers uh, the experiences of my independent school, which is well-resourced, but instead taking on a completely different sort of uh, thinking and approach that allows for a consensus-based decision-making and decentralizing this um, non, uh, and allowing for a non-hierarchical collective experience. And the way in which that has worked 
is that right at the start of the pandemic last school year, I reached out to the other two schools that are located on of the, the hill in, in the Riverdale and Ethical and uh, Fieldston section of the, of the Bronx. And I asked both of these schools who have very similar histories to the independent school that I'm at, to, if we can have more of a collective conversation about the work that we are, all of our schools were doing and uh, whether or not there were specific partners in, that we actually share within the community and how we can galvanize and allow for our work to be much more uh, put together instead of having things work in silo. I believe that you know this past year has shown just the power of allowing for this collective experience in in a way that I have not seen it before. And one of the things that has come out of this actual partnership with both uh, ethical culture and also with Fieldston. Uh, ethical culture of Fieldston and then also with Riverdale Country School is that we we then partnered with a um, nonprofit called Marshall Montefiore Community Center and we have a youth coalition so we have a number of students who are pulling together to ask really hard questions about what is happening within the Bronx what are some things that are really prevalent to them and the topics that have come out have been a myriad and it's been interesting to hear how our students are constantly thinking about how there are solutions instead of the way that sometimes adults approach it that this is way too complicated and maybe I don't want to go there but they are talking about you know food justice and they are talking about environmental spaces and representation they are talking about housing and where do we consider home and why do we consider home and how do we ensure that everyone's home offers all the things that they need and more not just to to sort of sustain, but to thrive. And what does that really mean? And it's been super, it's just been powerful to sit back and hear these young people speak together and have these sort of exchanges. Their hope is to be able to work together to then eventually host certain town halls, to expand the conversation with the larger Bronx community, and then eventually be able to have more of a, a say in policies and practices uh, in the education fields and maybe even beyond. So. You know, they have such vision and I'm just, I've, I'm able to be a facilitator in that work. And it's extremely powerful to learn from them and then also figure out how can I galvanize and even be a better model in the ways in which I'm actually partnering with each one of the schools that I'm working with and also with the actual agencies within the Bronx community. Well, you have, you have at least certainly my and our great respect for the what we think of as the guide on the side mm -hmm. approach you know versus the sage on the stage and i think i think that's huge and and it things things tend to go in the direction that they need to go in and and with a good guide on the side a teacher we we know things tend to lead towards something meaningful happening. So could you give us some examples of, of, of some meaningful things that have happened? Yeah, so I right away have to you know, talk about the after school programming that uh, the students at Horseman are able to be a part of uh, through an agency called Marshall Montefiore Community Center that I mentioned earlier. There are very specific electives that the fellows who are part of this after school program, uh, they are part of a service learning team and they are also part of a programming called HM246. 246 representing the actual street in which our school is, up, is uh, on, actually sits on physically. And one of the programs that has come out of this electives that has been built is there are fellows who have created an elective that is specific to the actual spaces, the lived spaces that we are a part of. So they call it uh, design and like housing. And what they are doing is they are also partnering with an organization called Summer on the Hill, which offers a number of after school and out of school time programming throughout the school year to students who are a part of the public school uh, experience in the Bronx and in various places in New York. And what these students have done through this design 
elective is they start with asking the, the young people, the fifth and sixth graders via Zoom, because everything is via Zoom this year. That's one thing that we pivoted to right away is they have asked them, tell me about your home and let's map it out. So, and then they have then done some research together as a group and have been able to then find out about other spaces that would make the, your home and environmentalism then be able to intersect in a more seamless, seamless way. So the students are then uh, tasked with, the, the grades, uh, fifth and, the fifth and sixth graders are tasked with having to reimagine their spaces. And some of them, you can see it, it's absolutely amazing. They have decided that they want to have more urban gardens in their spaces. Some students have built wind turbines on the top of their actual buildings. And I said, we need this in order to be able to think about energy in a new way. And I just think about just that opportunity to have these cross conversations with high schoolers and then also them being able to speak about their own home and then speaking with grades five and six and then speaking with these students as well. And then having this level of exchange and collaboration and building a space where people are starting with their own narratives and are starting with how I define home, that's where the power becomes and the power lives because there's an opportunity here for the, the students that are part of this work to then be able to center their own level of expertise. They are the experts. They can talk about where they are from and what an affirming space is that is, you know? And there's also an opportunity here where the, the students on both ends are able to then lead into an opportunity to then have a real exchange intellectually and take some intellectual risks, learn about some topics that maybe they weren't aware of before and learn about the ways in which people are looking at environmentalism in an expanded way that maybe it doesn't live in their, their daily experiences, but they're learning about now and wondering why, why their neighborhoods don't necessarily re reflect that. And thinking about this concept of environmentalism, you, you then have to think right away as, I'm, as I have watched this specific elective unfold is that environmental justice is a, is a topic that comes up, representation. So thinking specifically about when you think about an urban farmer or when you think about a farmer in general and the foods that we consume, are we also considering and, and centering the perspective of Black, Indigenous, and people of color and for historically marginalized communities and for those who are linguistically and culturally diverse, are their narratives brought into this as well? Because there is a different way at, in which people navigate spaces and especially thinking about navigating green spaces, which have been healing in so many ways, in so many ways and also think about the level of access. So there's so many opportunities here where the learning is able to be deepened and where I've noticed that, I've, that the students who have taken on this fellowship in their after school have started to think about what they're learning in their spaces, not only as a student, but also as a child growing up and being able to bring that into informing their own work. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, everything you say re really resonates. And I think the thing that I would go back to, Kim, is, you know, resonating with students. This is an early conversation I had today with um, another educator. Resonating is everything. Engaging, you know, is kind of a thrown around term. But resonating, I think, is a little bit deeper. And, and I, I would ask you to think about, without putting it on the spot, to situations where you have seen students resonate the most. OK, engage, fine. But resonate is a different thing. We, we, we understand the difference between us two. When, when have you seen students in surprising ways, surprising ways, resonate to something? You know, it's just so amazing because I, there's so many experiences in which I can 
uh, speak to. One of them, I will go back to the Youth Coalition. We currently have two students from uh, Farm Horsemen who are part of that. And it's been absolutely amazing to be able to sit and hear the exchanges that they are having with an expanded uh, group of, of youth. And one of the things that I will say right away is that what I the conversations and the way that they're entering these conversations is by, by speaking about their own complexity. So being able to say, you know, that I have this opportunity here as a student uh, in this in this very specific space, where it is an independent school that is well resourced, all of these other sorts of things. But then I also have this hat and this opportunity here to have an exchange with with people who are not necessarily always living all the experiences that I am having, and watching students, and watching in particular the two students who are part of the youth coalition over at HM have these sort of uh, opportunities where I'm noticing that they're deeply listening. They're stopping to think about what others are saying and they're tying it into what they have learned and what they have seen. I've tasked uh, these, these students in the last time that we met together to actually bring in a topic that they're, they're passionate about and to have an elevator speech. So tell me in just briefly in a few minutes, like why this topic resonates with you and why it's so important. And to hear students be able to not only speak about their own topics, but, it, but to be able to draw the connections that all of these things that we are talking about, all of these agencies that we are a part of, all of these institutions that are, are interlinked in all of these ways that we are talking about, how can we ensure that everyone is thriving in all of these spaces? These conversations, they don't happen in silo. They are happening all together. So let's name that and let's see the complexity within that. And let's also bear witness and build empathy. And sometimes that means just sitting back and saying, oh, I didn't know about that. Or yes, let me tell me a little bit more about that. And those are the opportunities and the moments that for me resonate and so much more important, especially now, given that we're in a climate that oftentimes does not necessarily a support th that level and that opportunity to be able to have those moments of tension or even those moments of conflict. So, so let's see, let me, let me walk this out very carefully. Mm -hmm. um, you, you work in an environment where there are a percentage of students of color of, you know, disenfranchisement, whatever we want to use as a term. And yet, at the same time, I'm trying to be very careful not to put you on the spot. You also work in a situation that is very privileged. Right. And how can you talk to us about we're, we're a very diverse group of educators here. How can you talk to us about the effect on the students who are not, and I, I emphasize not, in a position of color or disenfranchisement, apparently? How, how does this intersection happen? Did I, I, I don't want to set you up with an impossible question. Yeah, this is the part, you know, that I think is really important, Joe, to, and you're right to be very, you know, to take your time with the language, because that's literally one of the first conversations that I have with students, because oftentimes when service or community service or any of these topics come up, what happens is all, all there's some very problematic and deficit language that is utilized in order to describe Black, Indigenous, people of color, linguistically and diverse uh, uh, families to describe people who have been historically marginalized. So that's really one of the first places that I start with students with thinking about within the social justice lens, tell me what you're hearing, what you're seeing. And then let's talk about the power of language and how we need to, instead of talking about an opportunity gap or just talking about an, um, an actual you know, a, a gap in academics, we need to talk about an opportunity gap. Because oftentimes what we what is not said is that as the adults, is that we keep on replicating as an adult and as an educator, it's so easy for me to 
utilize language that can be extremely harmful and actually can, uh, can create a disservice in the work that I'm doing because what I'm doing is replicating a number of the stereotypes and I don't want to do that. I slow down and I'm very intentional about this with our students. That's why it's called service learning. The learning has to be a crucial component of it. And one of the things that I talk to with the students and the adults that are part of the program is, you know, we're constantly balancing the product, the process and the relationships. They're all important. This is a part of experiential learning. You're on the ground right now. And what you say and do, it matters. So I, I, I think oftentimes as an adult, as, as, as I hear young people regurgitating deficit language about uh, different you know, populations of people within the Bronx because they are used to a very negative narrative and are talking about you know, Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, in a way that they have seen on the news or wherever else, I, I take the time to pause and to discuss that and, and the reasons why we're going to rewrite that narrative. And it, that's why it's so crucial for me that within the programming and in, especially with the reflections that I bring in the actual community partners. I bring in those families. I bring in the people who are actually a part of the work on the grounds because I want them to speak to this. I bring in our alumni you know, I just had one of our alumni at one of our reflections just this past week, and she's doing a lot of work around civic engagement out in Maine right now. Uh, and it's so beautiful to, to hear from people who are not too far removed as well from our students for them to be able to say, I'm now out in the world and here's the way in which I'm now applying this work. The other thing that I will say, as people start to think about how am I going to apply this you know, social justice lens. And let me unpack that language just very briefly. Some things that I think about, and I've mentioned them, centering narratives. So think about whose narrative are you centering? Is it only one that we always hear, which is often the a narrative that can, can defame and can be really challenging and problematic for Black, Indigenous, and people of color that need, need us as educators to stop and think about whose narratives are being included and who's missing. And when we're, we're including this stuff in, into our work, I also have to go back to this bearing witness and build empathy. Sometimes it's just okay to sit and to listen. And oftentimes what I noticed is that there is this culture right now, especially amongst our young people that they always feel they have to be on and have the next thing to say and to ask. <laughs> There is a, that's problematic for us as the adults, for me as an educator, because I want my students to realize that there is a difference between sympathy and empathy. There's a, a real difference, there's a stark contrast in that. Because right now, if you have empathy, that means that you understand or you are understanding and you're taking the moment to be able to figure out what you may not have all the pieces for. The other piece that I task my students with as they're developing their actual electives is to ensure that they're building windows and mirrors. For those people who are literacy coaches or teachers out there, early childhood teachers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I want to ensure that in the programming that, my, that the students, that the high schoolers, yes, they are able to see themselves in the programming, but they're also thinking about the population of people who are predominantly <coughs> Black, Indigenous, and people of color throughout the Bronx area, that their narratives are also centered. And sometimes thinking about those who are multilingual as well. So being able to allow for that, that portion is critical. The, the other thing that I just want to mention uh, briefly, there's two other things. I keep on saying assume complexity. I know that as an educator, it's easy to then say, you know what, let me just give this cursory answer and just move this child along. And I think about just even the power of even with a small child being able to introduce them to characters through stories or through your own life or people that you bring in with helping them to understand that people can be yes and in so many ways and that people have a myriad of different hats and that that's okay and that's part of the complexity of being a human being. When you center that, then even a small child can see the humanity in another person. And here's the power in service learning is that I want you to see the humanity, not the stories, that narrative that, that you came up with, 
or something else that's out there, but instead the humanity in every single person, including those who are part of your team that you're working with within your school and then throughout our expanded community. Because by having my school be positioned specifically in the Bronx, I my expanded community is the Bronx. I have a stake in it. I'm a part of that work. So it's extremely important for me to be a part of that in that way. There is another piece in this that I can't, it would behoove me to not mention, and that is that in the midst of all of that's happening right now, I have to bring, uh, you know, and center one of the quotes that always sits with me. And it says, caring for self is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. And so many of you know this, this quote um, from Audrey. And I think that it is absolutely powerful to ensure that there is a level of care that is given to both our students and to the adults that are part of this work. Because oftentimes, uh, we are well-intentioned with wanting to be a part of our community and civic engagement and community service. and but. There's also this piece of not caring for self. And I am very intentional, especially as an educator, to constantly think about how can I ensure that I am, I am conscious of my ability to create a space that feels safe, where there is trust amongst the young people, and there is trust amongst young people and the adults that are part of this work, and that, that the different voices are able to be centered. The way that I do that is ensuring that it's not my voice only every time when we are together. I rarely speak during our reflections meetings. I have different students who are able to take that sort of lead with facilitating these conversations with each other and, and having other adults who are part of this and having our community members a part of it. Because I realize that there is a piece here where as you're hearing more about each other and you're able to center in that way, you're caring for each other because you're valuing and you're affirming that you matter. I see you. No, I see you. There's the power in it. I, there's specific ways that I do this. I bring music to all of our meetings. People know this. I let students bring the music. I, I allow them to bring their voice in that way because I realize that changes the mood. We have a mindfulness activity that we incorporate into our meetings uh, because stopping to breathe, even as an educator, is so needed, especially right now. We have to care for ourselves. We have to make sure that as we're caring for ourselves, that's a way of being able to care for others. Hasn't this year taught us that in so many ways? The last thing that I'm going to say, Joe, about all of this work, it requires radical imagination. It is time and our young people are saying it from the littlest ones who have voice and advocacy because I hear it even in our preschool programs where we're able to be able to speak to those students. They have an opinion about what should happen and how things should be or what's right and what's wrong and how to build community within their classroom and outside their classroom and with their families and all the way through middle school and high school thinking about how we need to embrace the radical imagination that our students already have. They're bringing the solutions, they're bringing the, the thoughts and the questions. They're bringing those moments of sitting there and trying to wrestle with certain things. And with that, I know that I'm on a journey as an educator to stand in that, to be able to say, I am a consistent and constant learner, that I'm not here to tell you top down that I now am a seer and know everything, even as Dr. Kim Joyce Bernard, that I still have so much to learn and I'm on this journey with you as my students, as my families, as the community partners, as the faculty and staff, as all of those people who I'm so honored to be working with. I think you summed it up well. I, I, I think that we're trying to reach all kids in wherever they may be. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to thank you for everything you had to say with us today. I, I thank you deeply, deeply, deeply. Thank you. It has been my pleasure. Thank you so much. And I'm just so thrilled to continue working and being a part of this journey with so many of you. So thank you so much for this time.